We're here today with Magistrate Judge Susan Russ Walker to talk about her life and her career. Judge Walker, thank you for taking time today out of your busy schedule to participate in this oral history for the United States District Court of the Middle District of Alabama. Oh, it's my pleasure. Let's start at the beginning, Judge. I understand you were born in Tennessee. Tell me about that. <laughs> That's right. I was born in Kingsport, Tennessee, which is in the upper northeast corner of Tennessee. The uh, town, I think at that time, was probably thirty to 35,000. And um, I was the youngest, and I guess still am the youngest, of four children. My parents um, got to Tennessee sort of serendipitously, I guess. that It was certainly not there intention from the beginning to end up there, but uh, my mother was from Alabama, from Birmingham in particular, and my father from New York and uh, later New Jersey. And my parents met in Alabama during the Second World War when my father was stationed uh, at Fort Rucker, and they met each other on a Greyhound bus. Um, I think my mother had a choice of soldiers to sit next to, and she preferred the one who ended up being my father, and sat by him, and he asked her to the Auburn, Alabama game, and uh, the rest was history. So anyway, they, they married and ended up after the war, first in Virginia, then in Tennessee, I think as a kind of compromise on location. I think my mother did not want to go live up north, and uh, my father was a banker, and he went to one banking job in Virginia and then to another in Tennessee. So that's where all of us grew up. I understand, though, you also have roots here in the Middle District of Alabama. Tell me about that. It, it, yes, in fact, my mother's father grew up on a farm, uh, used to be a plantation, I guess, in Lowndes County in a little town called Mount Willing. Um, and that's a town that, that you're familiar with as well. Uh, for the camera, we should note that uh, my interviewer, Laura Canary, um, formerly Laura Garrett, had ancestors in exactly that same little town. And uh, we both found that out when both of us worked together at the Attorney General's office for the state of Alabama. Um, so he, he's from there. My grandfather was. And uh, my grandmother was from another district. Uh, up near, up in Flint, Alabama, near Decatur. And what was your family's name from Wilds County? Well, let's see, we had the Lees and uh, the Ansleys. I guess those were the, the main names. There were some Colemans, there were some others. But uh, that particular ancestor was a Baptist minister, um, I think, a, and a, a planter or farmer. Um, and there were quite a few in the Baptist church. Um, in, in my family, both in Birmingham and there, who were um, either ministers or in other ways were uh, major participants in the life of the Baptist Church at that time. You also had a relative, I understand, who was a prominent jurist in Alabama. My great, great uncle, um, whose name was Henry Augustus Sharp, who uh, was from Birmingham and was from the part of the family that came from the uh, Decatur area originally, um, was a member of the state Supreme Court, the Alabama State Supreme Court, around the turn of the century. Um, I never met him, but uh, my mother grew up hearing about him and, and told me about him. Well, back to your family again. Tell me, was there anything unusual about your childhood? Let me think about what unusual might mean in that context. Um, I think in, it was a, a fairly normal childhood of the 1950s. Uh, we were pretty well sheltered from most everything, except that uh, all of us grew up, and you will recall that as well, uh, under the shadow of the Cold War and uh, knowing about uh, civil defense drills and um, the little fallout shelter stickers and, or posters and things of that kind. But uh, we lived in a, in a house on several acres and uh, in a suburb um, right in front of a big farm with a lot of acreage. And I grew up pretty much playing in the, in the woods and in the creek there. 
um, and doing the kinds of things kids do everywhere. I, the only thing that I would say might have been unusual is that my mother used a wheelchair um, and that itself was a sort of a different upbringing because uh, what we did needed to accommodate that disability. She had polio uh, before I was born and before my sister was born. So that was certainly a feature of our growing up. And so after she had polio, she was confined to a wheelchair? Yes. I, she did not like the term confined, I have to say. Um, she made she all of us say wheelchair. that she used a wheelchair. And she was very much uh, uh, interested in making sure that this handicap wasn't, in fact, a real disability. And she turned it into something of, of a cause. Um, and that's something all of us grew up with. And wasn't she also, both of your parents, but your mother in particular, very active in the community? They were, both of them. My father was a banker, as I think I said, and, uh, but he was also um, in the Rotary Club and the president of the community chest, and um, both of them were extremely active in our church, which was Presbyterian at that point. They compromised. My mother was a, a Baptist and my father was a Lutheran, and somehow that took them to being Presbyterians. Um, but he was very, very active both in community and church, and um, my mother was as well. Um, I almost can't think of anything she was not involved with, and that ranged from uh, organizations like Church Women United, which was an ecumenical group that brought people from different churches together, um, to being on the mayor's advisory council um, for handicap issues, those kinds of things. But she was uh, pretty well known in the community and, uh, and they were very involved. And hadn't she trained as a teacher? She did. She taught school in Birmingham at, uh, well, my recollection from, from what she told me was that she taught at Woodlawn High School, um, but it could have been that she taught at other elementary schools. But that family was a very academic family. Her father, uh, he was also a jury bailiff, but he, and this is much of this during the Depression, but he taught, uh, as I understand it, Latin and Greek and maybe some other ancient languages at what was then Howard College. So uh, he was a teacher. His wife, my grandmother, was a teacher. My mother was a teacher. She taught speech and drama. Her sisters were teachers in the Birmingham school system. Everybody taught. Um, and how did her training as a speech and drama teacher affect you? Uh, it affected me most concretely, probably in the fact that, that I was perforce in every church play, in every talent show that she directed, in anything she did. I, that, and I say perforce just because I, I don't recall having much choice of whether I did that or not, but all of us, that was true for, for all four children. And, uh, and I think fundamentally we enjoyed it and learned a lot. And later, um, I did a lot of oratory and debate and was in some plays as well. My brother won a national oratory contest. Um, all of us were involved in one way or the other and, and really got pretty used to public speaking just because we did it all the time, or it seemed to us that we did it all the time. And I understand that that flair for drama has shown up in another generation in your family as well. Well, the flair for drama actually skipped a generation, and I didn't get it. But my daughter, Lanier, <clears throat> loves to act and has been in a number of plays at the uh, Alabama Shakespeare Festival, which is a professional theater, and, uh, and she's great. She does a good job and uh, also does school plays and very interested in acting. And forensics as well. And in forensics as well. She, she won the forensics award this year um, and would be probably unhappy for me to have said that on tape. But uh, parents are, are as they are and they have to brag. Well, what were your activities in high school? Well, forensics was one and uh, there were many debate tournaments and uh, other speech and drama kinds of tournaments that 
that I went to. Um, I did not actually play sports at my high school. I played volleyball outside of high school in a league, um, but I, if I recall correctly, we did not have women's volleyball at my high school, though I was always interested in sports and, and did it as much as I could. I edited the newspaper. Um, Didn't you attend Girls' Day this morning? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I did for the state of Tennessee. You ran for a public office at Girls' Day, I understand. I did do that. That is true. I ran for judge, which was, I think, why you asked that question, <laughs> and, and was fortunate enough to, to win. And after that, I recall nothing about what we did. I suspect I never heard a case in that context. But I did do Girl State. Um, and model the UN, I understand. Model United Nations. Um, I think I, I was uh, at one point gold in my ear and on, uh, speaking on behalf of the this, of this state of Israel. And um, I think I did a number of other things, like the usual honor societies and beta club and student council and things of that kind. What were your favorite subjects in high school? English, to start. Um, I had terrific teachers, um, as, as I recall, all three years in, in high school. And I had a wonderful teacher my senior year in um, it was, a, it was a full year course, but the first half was American government, the second was some form of, of uh, political science. And I thoroughly in, enjoyed that, but I think English was always my first love. I loved art, but again, did not take classes in art in high school. There was just not enough time with all the other requirements, so I did that outside of school. Well, in high school, did you foresee what your future career might be, and what did you think it might be at that time? <laughs> I didn't foresee what it ended up to be. Um, I remember other students saying, especially some who did debate, saying they wanted to be lawyers and thinking that that really was the most boring possible profession to go into. Um, I think that I thought at, at one time that I would be an artist. Now, we're not going all the way back to when I wanted to be a cowgirl, I'm sure. No, we I'm won't sure. go that far back. But after that, I think I wanted to be an artist. And then I think I wanted to be an architect after someone told me that I, it wasn't practical to be an artist. And then after I learned that I might have to go to school for maybe as much as five years to be an architect, I didn't think maybe I wanted to do that. Um, and so I think I left high school thinking, because I liked to write, that I might be a journalist. And because I had enjoyed the political science, um, history, American government side of things, and, uh, and also had enjoyed editing the newspaper. Let's move on to college. Where did you go to college? When or where? Where? And Eckerd where? College. When did you start? In St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, I started in 1974. Tell me how you chose Eckerd as your college. I think I was looking at uh, some of the seven sister schools in, in New England. And the other alternative that had come up over and over again as I was growing up was this school called Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, which began as Florida Presbyterian College. And the reason I knew about it was because my oldest brother and then my next brother, and then my sister, had all gone there. Um, my oldest brother's name is Fritz, or Frederick, had uh, learned about the school, I think, through the church, um, and maybe had gone there uh, with a, a church youth group. He had intended to go to Duke. He had gotten an A.B. Duke scholarship. He was on his way, and something caused him to sh change course and, and go to Eckerd. My recollection, it was the fact that he could swim all year or something profound like that. But he went, he loved it. David, my next brother, went and loved it. Carol and my sister went and loved it. And by the time I was looking around for colleges, as I said, I looked at the seven sister schools and I looked at Eckerd. In the end, I don't even know if I applied to any of the others. I, got, I applied early to Eckerd and I got a scholarship there. And... Uh, chose it and have been involved with the college ever since. I'm sure 
Um, the fact that Eckerd's campus is located on the beach had nothing to do with that decision. No, I wouldn't enjoy that at all. Uh, that it's it's a, actually a beautiful campus. They they talk about going to school in paradise there, and there there's some truth to that. And how are you involved with Eckerd now? I'm on the board of directors. Um, at the moment, the chair of the student life committee, and uh, on the executive committee. Um, and, and another one, a committee for trustees. Um, but I've been involved one way or the other for some time, including teaching a uh, class on law and literature there before, um, going down to speak on several occasions and sometimes just visiting. What activities did you participate in in college? Well, I did some of the same. I edited the newspaper there, um, which was a, a pretty big undertaking. It was a weekly paper, not a daily, but even so, it, it took a, a good bit of time. I played basketball my first year. I was a very short guard, um, but I enjoyed it. And um, played volleyball, I think, I think all four years. And that was intercollegiate? That was, inter both of them were intercollegiate. I, I'm sure I played some intramurals. Um, I think I played football. Um, we had an event called Homely Coming instead of Homecoming because it was a small college without a football team. And for that event, the women played football and the men were the cheerleaders. So I think I might have been the quarterback of the, uh, the Powder Puff football team. And uh, I had a pretty good arm, but that's where the talent ended. I could throw so long as we weren't in a game. If we were in a game, it got too hard, and I usually didn't complete the pass, if I recall, and I don't think anybody cared. My understanding is you had a number of scholarships to Eckerd. Um, weren't you also a National Merit semi semifinalist? I had a, a what was called a school-sponsored sc National Merit scholarship to Eckerd, and um, it may be that there were others I can't recall now. What did you major in in college? I majored in English, and I, I don't know that I thought that I would do that when I went there, but I took some English classes and thoroughly enjoyed them. I had always liked to read, and to this day, I think, uh, effectively read all the time. Of course, one does in, in this job as well, but uh, I read a lot. And I, as I said, like to write. So that's where I ended up. And I understand you also um, had a summer abroad when you were in college? It wasn't a summer. What I did was a semester abroad in London and a, another winter term, which is another month later on. So I spent time in London and in the Lake District and then traveling on the continent um, hitchhiking, I'm afraid, which I wouldn't recommend now, but was very exciting in those days. Um, so I, I did that. I know you had a lot of, of activities in college in addition to the college newspaper. Uh, do you recall any of the others? Um, I remember, besides the athletics and the newspaper, doing um, some some governance roles, I guess, uh, representing my collegium. Uh, Eckerd is divided into collegia, and mine happened to be the Letters Collegium, which is philosophy and history and English and political science, those sort, kinds of things. Um, and also uh, participating on what was called the expanded faculty, which was really the faculty plus some, some students. Later, I worked um, as a work scholar and uh, wrote speeches for the president of the, of the college and also wrote um, news releases and that kind of thing. I also studied art there and from time to time uh, felt like I had the uh, opportunity or the, the time to take an art class so I was sometimes in the studio. Did you change your idea about what you wanted to do for a living while you were in college? Um, I really didn't. When I left college, I expected to go get a PhD in English and to teach. 
So what did you do immediately after college? I went to the University of Virginia to get a PhD and of course a master's first. Um, University of Virginia had and has a, an extremely good English department. I had focused probably a bit more on Renaissance literature in college and uh, at the University of Virginia I did a bit more medieval literature. Um, it, it would have been a two-year master's program and I completed the first year but uh, interrupted that to go study at Oxford also uh, studying English. And what occasions you're going to Oxford? Well I was fortunate enough to, to win a, a Rhodes Scholarship from um, Tennessee and uh, left to take up the scholarship. Why did you apply to be a Rhodes Scholar? The opportunity is just uh, amazing to uh, go study at a uh, not just a university in another country but a, an, an extremely uh, excellent university with a an amazing tradition and history. Um, I was also interested in the course that was offered there in English language and literature. Um, somehow how I had managed to get through college taking whatever suited my fancy and so I had a, a, a wide range of literature courses but I had missed some of the, the basics and the Oxford course uh, we didn't do the first year of it. Um, everybody who came in and did this uh, course as a Rhodes Scholar did the second two years. So I didn't do the Old English portion or the very modern portion. But I began with Middle English and went through, I guess the latest people that I studied were, were probably people like Tennyson. So it didn't go very late. Um, I, actually, I, I had some Jane Austen and some other people like that. But anyway, it, it was a, a march through um, the the best known classics, I guess, of the English speaking world, in order from beginning to end, uh, with tutors who were um, remarkable scholars. And you were one of only thirty two Rhodes Scholars chosen. I understand there are only thirty two chosen each year. Is that correct? They're thirty two from the United States. And you were one of the thirty two. Um, you also received a first, explain that in the English language and literature. Well, Oxford has, its, its degrees are given with um, first class, second class, third, I think below that maybe just failing, I'm not, not really sure. Um, the, the degrees have, there are no grades as you progress through Oxford, uh, one simply takes exams at the end of the year, uh, at the end of the second year in my case. And uh, these were, I think there were nine days of exams, am I saying that right? No, it was over the course of six days and I guess there were nine three-hour exams in that period. And at the end, uh, this is all graded by independent examiners who don't know who you are, it's all done anonymously. and if you are a really good student, you get a first. And I didn't. Um, I had enough what they call alpha on these exams, and they're graded unusually. It's a, you can get a beta triple alpha or a beta double plus. I mean, there are all kinds of Greek letters and pluses and minuses involved, but apparently I had enough alpha on these exam grades so that they decided to give me and and others I think I don't know how many did this but a, a number of other people what's called a viva examination viva voce they call it uh, which is an oral exam so I had to stay after everybody else left and study some more and finally go to I think it was at the examination schools which is a ancient building down on um, a, a big street in Oxford um, and it, I, I have a little trouble picturing exactly what the location was but I remember going in and I remember having a gown on and uh, I think I had to take the little mushroom looking cap that they gave me 
uh, although I'm confident that I didn't wear it. And uh, I remember going inside uh, a room and being faced with the entire English faculty, or at least all of the faculty that was involved as, an, as examiners. Um, and they asked me a lot of questions about various um, subjects. I can remember questions on John Dunn and Andrew Marvel and, um, uh, and others. And uh, I recall being relatively tongue-tied, but it, I guess, worked okay because they ended up giving me a first, but not until after this uh, oral exam. Very good. And what was your college in Oxford? Somerville College. I understand there's some other famous women who um, went to Somerville College. Well, if, actually, Oxford didn't admit women for such a long time that uh, virtually any women that anybody's ever heard about who went to Oxford uh, up until much more recent times either had to go to Somerville or one of the other women's colleges. There was a point where there were some others that were uh, that became mixed, but uh, Margaret Thatcher and Indira Gandhi and and many others um, that that you may have heard about went to Somerville. You also participated in sports, I know, on a much more informal basis. At, I think you played sports at the University of Virginia and at, in Oxford. Tell I me did. about that. The, actually, the, the experience at the University of Virginia was in some ways more formal than any of them because, as you know, the University of Virginia is in the ACC, which is a, a pretty darn big conference. Um, when I was there, I played volleyball. But I played for, for a, the club team. They did not have women's varsity when I was there, nor if they had had would I have been able to play because I was a graduate student. But instead they had a club team. But the club team competed in the ACC tournament, played the other ACC schools, and uh, I was a setter and uh, played for a year there. We also had some, I think, co-ed volleyball that, uh, that we played. And then I, I did play at Oxford as well. There the, uh, the big game is against Cambridge. And uh, I, I can assure you that, Ox that, that volleyball was not their big sport. Um, the blues sports at Oxford are things like rugby and soccer and rowing and that sort of thing. But we did play at the Crystal Palace in London, and we were soundly thrashed by Cambridge. But I understand you received a half blue. What is that? A half blue. I've never quite understood what a half blue is. I think the half blue signifies simply that it was a considered a more minor sport. Basketball, for example, would be a half blue at Oxford, unlike here, where it's much more prominent. Um, and there are many of, of, of that kind. And that's sort of like lettering in the I sport? I think it must be. I have a blues sweater from that time. It's a it looks like a, a white tennis sweater with a v-neck and it has something about volleyball on the front and uh, that's that's my recollection of what being a half blue involved. I, I understand you may have had a few injuries playing football too at Oxford, <laughs> the American kind. Yes, um, I'm trying to think if I had more than one. I think the other injury might have inv involved a, a moped but anyway, um, and, and that story may, may be better not told on this tape, but uh, I, I, there was a, a routine game of American football, I think every Sunday, um, on the, uh, one of the playing fields at the university, and people gathered from different colleges. And it wasn't always Americans, but it was mostly Americans, and we played football. And uh, fortunately, that time I was not the quarterback, but was thrown a ball by another Rhodes Scholar who uh, used to be the quarterback for the University of West Virginia football team. And I think his capacity to throw was a little greater than mine was to catch. And I, I tried to catch the pass and um, somehow ended up tangled up with uh, someone who later became a pretty well-known doctor on the ground. And uh, that was fine, except that I broke my ankle and and also drop the pass. Oh dear. Was there anything else important to you about your experience at Oxford? 
gosh, uh, lots of things, I'm, I'm sure. There was a great opportunity to travel, so I spent a fair amount of time um, traveling in Europe. There was, um, unlike our schools, much more time to study and to read, and um, I spent a lot of days, and they were pretty happy when shut up with books in the library, not doing much more than just just reading my way through what I thought was interesting. There were lectures there that were not compulsory, but um, that one could go to if, if you wished. And um, I recall very clearly going to one on the subject of Middle English translation, and I can't think of anything that would sound drier than going to that. And, and it, but in fact, it was really great. So there are things of that kind that were wonderful. Um, the the people who went from uh, America and from Canada in particular became, many of them became very close friends and I've stayed in touch over the years. Um, probably hard to describe the, the, the richness of that experience and I'm, I'm grateful for having gotten to do it. When did you, or what did you do when you came back to the United States and about, I guess that was about 1980. When I came back, um, I had started having the heretical thought that I might not want to finish a PhD and teach. And I think that was largely because I, although I think I would have thoroughly enjoyed teaching, I was not as eager as I had been at the beginning to write literary criticism, uh, which to me had become, this was in the days of of structuralism and a lot of influence from French philosophy and uh, literary criticism had become to me to some degree irrelevant. There were things about it that I think were important but it, it, it meant writing footnotes about footnotes in a way and doing that at great length and, and I, I wasn't sure I, I would enjoy that. I had always been drawn also to sort of public affairs and um, the, those sorts of interests too. So anyway, I was thinking about maybe not continuing with that and thought I would work for a couple of years. I uh, also needed, frankly, to make some money to pay for graduate school. So I came back to Washington. I had never lived there or in any big city before and um, looked for a job, thought that I would probably be... Um, invited to do all kinds of interesting things in Washington, found that I had not had a call from the President or Congress or somebody else wanting me to come help them and, and, uh, and save the world. And uh, so ended up finding a job with a trade association. As you know, Washington is full of those. Um, and this, was, this happened to be the American Petroleum Institute where I knew a friend of a, of a friend. And so I, I was qualified to be a writer, and that's what I did. I wrote for a couple of years. Well, also, between terms at Oxford, didn't you go to, to um, Washington and work in the summers? I did. And where did, you, where did you work and what did you do in those summers? At, when I was at the University of Virginia, um, I saw a sign advertising internships, which was not uncommon. There were a number of things of that sort of available. But this particular sign advertised internships at the Central Intelligence Agency. And my first thought, and this was in, in the time where not only Big Oil, who I ended up working for, but the CIA and a few other uh, organizations of, of that kind were, were in some disrepute. They were, it was not really a popular thing to want to work for any of those places. And I had that reaction when I saw the sign. I thought, why would I want to do something like that? And then thought, why wouldn't I? Why would I rule something like that out a priori? So I started to look into it, um, maybe as much as anything out of curiosity. Found that there was no position for somebody with my background. And you can imagine that it'd be hard to place an English major at the CIA, though if I had had language skills or computer skills, that would have been different. And I, and I think that made me even a little more determined. Plus, it was really good money. And I, again, needed money for graduate school. So I ended up writing 
the CIA and, and saying, don't you want an, in, uh, an intern who can, can write, maybe, in your public affairs office or something of that kind? And sure enough, they hired me. And so I worked there one summer. And then the second summer, uh, I went back to work there. I worked for Stansfield Turner, who was then the director of the agency, wrote some speeches, uh, did things of that kind. I can't represent that I did anything of, of, of great importance there, but I learned a lot and saw a lot. Um, things that I had, it was an experience that I had never really imagined having, and I found it very interesting. Well, tell us about what you did at uh, the Petroleum Institute. I really was a writer, which meant um, I had, there was a large staff of writers. Again, not something I would have known about a, a, a group like that. And we produced speeches and we produced books, uh, larger and smaller, different sizes, um, and articles uh, about uh, various aspects of the oil industry, and that sounds dull. In fact, there were lots of controversies at the time about things like price controls, um, windfall profits taxes, the kinds of issues that would come up in Congress, and uh, those are the sorts of things we would research and, and write about, and I think I had uh, the responsibility for one of the, the uh, bigger publications that got done at that time, which um, if I recall, was, was more of a summary of a lot of different issues. But the, maybe the most important thing besides getting to see Washington and live in a big city and uh, go to the museums and the stores and the theaters and so forth was the opportunity to work for people who were professional writers who cared a lot about language, um, who had a lot to teach about how you go about trying to do that well. And how long did you work for the, for the American Petroleum Institute? I think it was close to two years. At some point in there, I had applied to, to law school, so I, I knew I would be going there in the fall. Why did you decide to apply to law school? I'm still not sure. <laughs> in, some, in some ways, um, I think that law may have found me rather than my finding law. And what I mean by that is I, unlike many people who become lawyers and judges, as I said before, I really didn't ever think I would be a lawyer. But the skills that you use to be a lawyer seem to be what I knew how to do. Um, lots of writing and research and speaking and analytical thinking, one hopes, and that sort of thing. So I think as time passed, I realized that, that this might be something that I could do and that the other things that interested me, like reading or art or whatever, I could still do as well and maybe not make a career of those, but uh, wouldn't have to quit doing them either. And, and I understand you applied to several law schools. What, what are some of the law schools you applied to? I applied to, f to four law schools, is, is my recollection. I knew very little when I came back uh, about law school. Nobody in my family had gone. They had most of them gone to business school in my immediate family. Um, so I got a list of the top law schools and took the top four from the list. I think it was Harvard and Yale and Stanford and Chicago and, uh, and applied to all of them and was fortunate enough to get into all of them and then was faced with trying to figure out well, which would be the best to go to. and um, So you picked the number one on the list. I, I did. Maybe that wasn't imaginative, but it, I guess it, uh, it seemed like a good idea. I remember I didn't have the money to go to Stanford and look at it. And um, Chicago sounded awfully cold to me. I had never been to Chicago. So I visited Harvard and I visited Yale and I chose Yale. And I was very happy with the choice. It was the much smaller law school. Much smaller law school. What? When did you start Yale Law School? Was that 1982? Well, I've learned that I need to ask you the dates. So uh, if that's what it, what uh, what I've told you, I think that's right. Yes, it was 1982. How large was your class there? I'm not sure. My recollection is it may have been around 80 or so, but uh, I, 
I actually don't know for don't recall specifically. It was small compared with uh, other law school, many other law school classes. Well, tell us about your experience at Yale. It was really, it was really wonderful. The uh, one of the best things about Yale uh, at that time, and I think now still, is that it draws a, from a very broad base of students, and the school is interested in um, in real diversity. So there were some people who were right out of college, but there were plenty of people like me who had done other things and pursued other degrees. Um, I remember uh, some who were in their 50s at the time, some much older students, people who were getting joint degrees in medicine and law, people who came from other countries. It was a real wide variety of people. And uh, they, they were awfully smart and very challenging. Um, it was a competitive environment, but they, they, I think, tried hard to ratchet that back down a little bit by not emphasizing class rank and that sort of thing. But um, it was the, the professors were terrific, and um, it was always interesting and always very challenging. Well, despite the fact they did not emphasize class ranking, my understanding is you did very well at Yale Law School. I'm not sure how you know that, if that's true. Received some awards while you were there. There were some prizes that, that Yale gave um, that in fairly typical fashion for me, I was clueless about until somebody told me that I was going to get that prize. And the prizes that I can recall, I think two of them were legal writing prizes and one was for Barrister's Union. I did know about that and that there were two different competitions um, of that sort. There was moot court which was the appellate level and then there was Barrister's Union which was the trial court level and uh, my roommate and I um, decided not to compete against each other so she did moot court and I liked the idea of arguing to a jury so I did Barrister's Union and we were um, we were very fortunate, and she won moot court, and I was one of the ones who won Barrister's Union. There were several awards given for that, but it was a great experience. So what did you do after law school? Well, most people, or I think it's the majority at least at Yale, uh, tend to go to, to uh, clerkships, and um, I thought hard about, I, I was confident that I wanted to clerk, but I wasn't sure where. But since I had been in New England for several years, and Washington before that, and Oxford before that, uh, during that time I had, I had begun to realize that, that I was really a Southerner at heart, and that I wanted to go back to the South. So when I, the time came to look for clerkships, I looked exclusively in the South. And I can remember um, talking with Burke Marshall, who uh, has died within the last few years, but who is a former assistant attorney general for uh, civil rights under Bobby Kennedy. I mean, he, he worked with, with Kennedy and was a, an absolutely fine teacher and scholar at Yale, um, and asking him if he would recommend me for a clerkship, um, because that, obviously that's the way it works. The professor's write recommendations, and he said he did not write recommendations for anybody for clerkships. And then he said, but I, there's one exception. He said, if you want a clerk for Judge Frank Johnson on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, he says, I will write you a recommendation. And I had heard the name, uh, everybody's heard the name of Frank Johnson. If you've been in law school or maybe even been alive on this planet, I'm not sure, but um, I did a little bit of research and came back and asked, would he please do that? And he was kind enough to write Judge Johnson, um, as did some others. And I think from that moment, that was pretty much the clerkship I was most interested in. And the one you eventually accepted. I'm That's sure. right. Tell me about your first meeting with Judge Johnson. I don't think I can recall exactly the... the uh, first meeting, I remember his interviewing me. I remember that he had his law clerks also interview candidates, which I thought was a good idea. Um, 
so that he wasn't the only one doing it. He wanted to know how you might fit in with the chambers. And um, I remember he was very straightforward. Um, it was customary then, and I expect it is now, for judges to make an offer as soon as possible uh, and to expect that you would accept or reject right away. And he made an offer, I think, by the end of the session to, to me, and I said, yes, sir, I'd like to come. And um, I know that I felt a degree of comfort with him that I didn't expect because although I didn't grow up what you'd call a real country girl, I guess, in Tennessee, that was the sort of setting that I was in. And um, with a, a, a farm behind our house and my liking to be outdoors and that sort of thing, I was, um, I guess, not despite many years of other people's attempts to put polish on me, I was not all that citified. And, and uh, Judge Johnson, of course, was very down to earth, very proud of coming from Winston County. Um, somebody I was, I was comfortable with because of that. And you moved to Montgomery then. And I did. began to work for Judge Johnson. How long did you clerk for him? That clerkship is uh, is a one year clerkship, so I did that for a, for a full year. Was there anything memorable about your year clerkship, Judge Johnson? Probably lots of things, and some of them maybe I don't remember as well as I should. Um, I remember um, one thing that had nothing to do with law, which is that that Ruth Johnson, his his wife, who is in her own right a, a wonderful person decided that the clerks that year um, would put on an anniversary celebration for Judge Johnson and that we would learn how to clog because Judge Johnson could buck dance and he liked Rocky Top. That was what he liked to, to, to buck dance to and she thought maybe we ought to do that. Um, and we were a really unlikely bunch. She found somebody to teach us and we went out, I think it was at the um, maybe at the military base, we went out for some lessons and uh, uh, were pretty pathetic. I think that I was maybe the most pathetic of the bunch. My colleagues did a lot better. Um, but in the clutch, we pulled it out. We actually clogged uh, in front of a whole lot of former law clerks and other judges. And uh, we had little taps on our shoes and we did Rocky Top and they joined us and, and, and we had a, a great time. There's a film of that somewhere which I hope will always remain buried <laughs> and never be unearthed. I think you're too modest. I've seen you clog. <laughs> you have. <laughs> That's a frightening thought. Do you remember any particular cases you worked on or any particular conversations you had with Judge Johnson during that period of time? Well, I remember probably the most dramatic event of that clerkship from my perspective, dramatic and embarrassing, was I heard Judge Johnson and Miss Perry, his secretary, talking um, about somebody, I don't know if it was a clerk for another judge or if it was somebody who wanted to clerk for Judge Johnson, I can't remember that, but talking about someone who had not actually graduated from law school and who was going to clerk or was asking to clerk. And I remember their being somewhat shocked that this person would consider this. And it dawned on me that maybe I needed to tell Judge Johnson that I hadn't graduated from law school when I started the clerkship. The barristers union that we talked about earlier had had several rounds of competition. And when I started, I hadn't really thought through the fact that I might have to get another case ready for trial and another case ready for trial all through the last semester of law school. When I got into those other levels of competition, I ended up spending time getting my trial ready, trials ready, and did not finish the last paper that I had left to do and thought, this is not a problem, I'll finish it over the summer. Yale wasn't concerned about it, and uh, that was something I thought would not be that difficult to, to finish up. But when I heard them talking, 
I thought, I've got to go tell Judge Johnson that I hadn't graduated and maybe I shouldn't be here. I, I was suddenly very concerned that I was violating some rule that I hadn't uh, been aware of, although I probably should have been. And one thing about Judge Johnson, he is not a person that you ever even think about telling a lie to or keeping the truth from or in any way not being candid. And I have struggled with it for a few minutes and marched myself in and told him. And he pretty much right then said, he, he, didn't, he didn't say anything critical. He just said, go home and get that paper done. And I did. I didn't do any work at the office for the next probably week or so. Um, I think I missed a court sitting as a result of it. Um, I had to keep up with my work, but he, he was basically telling me, get it done and get it done now, and I can assure you that I got it done. And uh, the degree was granted and I was in good standing. But that was the sort of person he was. Um, if, you, if you had a, um, a flaw or something you'd overlooked or something you weren't being candid about, something about Judge Johnson would, would make you examine that and confess, and I'm a prime example. What about your fellow clerks? Uh, are you still in touch with some of your fellow clerks from that time? I'm, I'm not closely in touch in the sense that I, I certainly don't hear from them and they don't hear from me uh, frequently. But um, one of them went to law school with me. And in fact, I got an email uh, yesterday or the day before from him collecting news for um, law school reunion purposes and another one um, I've seen on and off, and uh, if you clerk for Judge Johnson, um, you pretty much return to Montgomery from from time to time for various things. And of course, all of us um, over the years try to keep up with Mrs. Johnson as well. Well, what did you do after your clerkship? Well, I um, had done in law school uh, a good bit of public interest law work. I had always been interested in public service law. When I say always, I mean only from the time I started thinking about law and uh, was interested in, in government service or um, other kinds of things. In law school, for example, I had uh, gone to work one summer back close to where I grew up in um, what could, I guess, best be referred to as darkest Appalachia. I mean, it was a uh, legal services position out in the hills and hollers of eastern Kentucky. Um, and so I'd had experiences like that, that that sort of confirmed my desire to do public service work of some kind. And, and when I looked around in Alabama, um, one of the things that interested me was actually going to work for the government in the Attorney General's office. I, I, I didn't think I would stay there, but I wanted to see what state service uh, or government service was like, I knew most people left law school and went straight to private firms, certainly most people at Yale did after their clerkships, if they clerked, and uh, I wanted an experience a little bit different from that to begin with at least. So I went uh, to the Attorney General's office. That but, was in 19, about 1987? And thank you for the prompt, it was <laughs> about 1987, uh, probably 86 when I began. And that's where I met you. Uh, both of us were in the civil division and um, working on civil cases at that time. It's my recollection you specialize somewhat in voting rights law there, is that? Yeah, I think I didn't set out to do that, but when I came in, I believe we already had um, one big voting, voting rights case then which I worked on with a lawyer from Walsh and Bingham, Dave Boyd, and, uh, and some others. And uh, that had to do with the way um, city councils, school board members, and others were elected in the state of Alabama, and it was a statewide lawsuit. So yeah, once you, once you learn something about voting rights law, because it's a slightly arcane subject, it makes sense to keep doing it. And we had other cases, and I continued with many of those. And were those some of the most important or the more important cases you worked on at the Attorney General's office? They were office? The, the biggest, I think. Um, another one was uh, 
a case involving the election of, of state judges, which uh, was actually tried here in, in the federal court and, and was a, a voting rights case that was large and took a lot of time and garnered a lot of interest. Um, and uh, there were many other, I think, smaller voting rights cases, too, of that kind. And that's not all I did, but that was something that I did a fair amount of. Did you participate in the trial of the judge's voting rights yes, case? Yes, I sure did. I participated in a manner of speaking. I did a tremendous amount of writing and preparing witnesses, and uh, including brief writing and that sort of thing. It, as it happened, I think I was close to eight months pregnant when the case was tried. So I, I remember very clearly uh, doing some of my examination of witnesses from a sitting position because of that. I think we skipped over a very important event in your life, um, and that is, tell us how you met your husband. First tell us who your husband is and how you met him. My husband is Dorman Walker, who is a native of Montgomery, and um, I met him through Dave Boyd, who was the uh, lawyer that I worked with on the first voting rights case I mentioned, which was styled originally Dillard versus Crenshaw County. And David and I, Dave and I were co-counsel, and uh, he introduced me to Dorman. Um, Dorman was also a lawyer. He was also a lawyer at the same firm, which is Balsh, Balsh and Bingham, still is a lawyer there. And uh, one thing led to another, and eventually we got married. And uh, we have one daughter whose name is Lanier, who I mentioned earlier, you mentioned earlier. And she participated in the judge's voting rights case, She participated um, as, a, as a silent but palpable presence. Back to your time at the AG's office, um, did anything happen during that period of time that was significant in your legal career? or in your life, other than meeting your husband, of course. Well, and I think we skipped over a very important event in your life, um, and that is, tell us how you met your husband. Well, first tell us who your husband is and how you met him. My husband is Dorman Walker, who is a native of Montgomery, and um, I met him through Dave Boyd, who was the uh, lawyer that I worked with on the first voting rights case I mentioned, which was styled originally Dillard versus Crenshaw County. And David and I, Dave and I were co-counsel, and uh, he introduced me to Dorman. Um, Dorman was also a lawyer. He was also a lawyer at the same firm, which is Balsh, Balsh and Bingham, still is a lawyer there. And uh, one thing led to another, and eventually we got married. And uh, we have one daughter, whose name is Lanier, who I mentioned earlier, you mentioned earlier. And she participated in the judge's voting rights case. She too. participated um, as a as a silent but palpable presence. Back to your time at the AG's office, um, did anything happen during that period of time that was significant in your legal career or in your life, other than meeting your husband, of course? I I don't remember a single event or anything to single out from that specifically, but it was a, it was a, I guess a time of, of maturing and getting some understanding of what practicing law might actually be like. Um, it was practicing law from a, a particular standpoint is, as you know, it's easier to defend the government than most other clients because there's so many additional immunities and other defenses that apply. Um, but I, I went through the, the basic things every lawyer goes through there, which was everything from learning how to prepare for and take a deposition to doing a whole lot of brief writing. So that was significant. I still remember the people there, um, you included, of course, but, um, but many others that I worked with who I, I thought were very fine lawyers. And, um, and I thoroughly enjoyed uh, working there and looking at things from, from that point of view. At, at some point, I thought it was probably time to move on and, and uh, understand a bit more about what private practice was like, but I'm glad to this day that I began with that government service. And you stayed there about two years, didn't you? That's right. Judge Walker, I'd like to go back for a minute and, and ask you a little more about 
your involvement with the Rhodes Scholarship Program over the years since you left Oxford. Tell us about that, please. Well, when I went to Oxford, uh, very few women had been elected. I was in the second year of, of women's being eligible to be Rhodes Scholars, and so they were eager to get women on selection committees. At that time, the selection was state by state. There would be usually four candidates sent from each state, I'm sorry, two candidates from each state sent to a district competition, and then four were usually chosen from each of the districts. Um, and they wanted women on those selection committees. So I was sort of bused to various selection committees for a matter of probably the first 10 or 12 years and traveled, um, I remember, to Colorado and Minnesota and um, Pennsylvania, all, all over the place to, to participate on selection committees. Ultimately, um, they must have decided that it was time for me to settle down. So I, I did some selection committees um, in the South, including Alabama, Mississippi, uh, the regional in New Orleans. And after many years, ended up um, being what they call the secretary for Alabama's selection committee, which meant that I was in charge of the arrangements and the one who sent the invitations and um, essentially hosted the event. But we would always choose a chairman for the interviews who was not a Rhodes Scholar. Um, and that person, it might be different from year to year, and that person actually would chair that committee. So I did that for a number of years, and recently, um, because I had been um, Secretary for the State of Alabama for, I think it might have been six years, five or six years, then I rotated off and I'm not now on any committees, which is the, the rules of the American Association of Rhodes Scholars or the Rhodes Trust. I'm not sure where the rule comes from. but um, So now I don't participate in, and I, I may again. Although as time passes, you, you realize you know less and less about less and less than the, than the students coming up do. It's remarkable how well prepared they are these days. And I'm not sure I've kept up to the point uh, now that I, that I would feel completely comfortable asking uh, questions in the English literature. I wish, wish that I had, but um, it's a remarkable group nowadays. After you left the Attorney General's office, you went into private practice. Yes. I think that was about 1989, wasn't yes. it? With whom did you practice? I went to practice with Miller, Hamilton, Snyder, and Odom, which was a mobile firm. Um, I happened to know Mike Waters, who actually had a Rhodes Scholarship from Alabama, and uh, I'd met him on the selection committees. And he was in charge of their Montgomery office, which was a very small office in the Colonial Bank building. Mike did a fair amount of securities law and corporate law of, of various kinds, which was, I was a, a litigator, I didn't do as much of that, but uh, they were willing to have somebody do litigation in Montgomery in that sort of satellite office. So that's where I went. And what was your practice like there? I had a really wide range of cases. Um, I still did some voting rights work, as, as we've discussed, and there were other voting rights cases that were um, similar to, to what we've talked about. Um, I did some employment discrimination, and I did it plaintiff side and defense side. Um, probably a bit more defendant's work, but um, I had a case, for example, on behalf of a man who was a Jehovah's Witness who had been um, fired from his job because he couldn't work the hours that the employer wanted him to work because of his religion. Um, I did some uh, other plaintiff side uh, anti-discrimination work, I guess you'd call it, um, on behalf of people with disabilities. Um, one of them a lawsuit um, relating to architectural barriers at the Alabama State House. And uh, another one uh, on behalf of a woman who uh, was having a baby and could not get uh, get the hospital to provide her with an interpreter. Um, so there were some of, of that kind. Um, and, and now that I think about it, the gentleman I mentioned a moment ago was not a Jehovah's Witness but a Seventh-day Adventist. And the Jehovah's Witness plaintiff 
that, uh, that I represented actually was in another case that involved a hospital stay. This was an appointment. Um, I was called very late, I think, in the evening uh, by a state court judge here who uh, wanted to appoint me to represent a younger girl who was a Jehovah's Witness who um, did not want to have a blood transfusion. And uh, that's how I confused the two, but um, I, I can recall that clearly. I did some constitutional law. I had a uh, case that was pretty well known in this state um, representing the uh, Alabama Coalition for Equity, the uh, often known as ACE, which was a group of um, school superintendents and others who wanted to work toward equalizing funding for, um, uh, for, for primary and secondary schools in the state of Alabama. And uh, I represented them along with uh, Bo Torbert, who's the former uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and other, several other very able counsel. Um, so that was a, a big lawsuit. Judge, I understand, too, that you handled criminal appointments when you were in private practice. Tell us about that. I, I don't think I did that on purpose. In other words, I don't remember ever signing up on a list to be appointed. Uh, what I do remember is getting calls, um, or maybe even notices in the mail, I can't recall how, how I learned it, uh, indicating that I had been appointed to a criminal case. And I knew nothing about criminal law other than uh, the fact that in law school it was really one of my favorite classes. Um, but somehow I thought that if you were appointed to a criminal case you were supposed to take it and it didn't occur to me that that I could say no so I I accepted and went and, and met with the defendants um, who may not have been being given any great gift by getting me since I, I wasn't that familiar but um, I ended up probably doing three or four um, fairly significant criminal cases, including a trial, um, at least one trial, there may have been several others, and uh, again, thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I always liked getting out on the floor of the, of the courtroom, actually walking around, talking, arguing to a jury, questioning witnesses, that sort of thing, and that was a terrific opportunity to do that. And were all of those cases in state court? They were, and the one I remember in particular was a rape trial. Um, and and we, my client prevailed, um, and I, I think that I may not even have had enough experience to understand that most people entered guilty pleas at that point, um, and never, I, I certainly discussed it with him, I asked him if he wanted to do it, but I looked at that case as though I would try it from the beginning. And of course, I know now, having been in, in the system for as long as I have, that in fact, most cases do plead and most don't try, but at the time I just assumed that's what we were doing, so that's what we did, and um, he, he was successful in that trial. I know you practiced a great deal in federal court as well. Yes. What types of cases, uh, other than some of the ones you've talked about, uh, or you can discuss in more detail some of the ones you've talked about, that, that did you handle in federal court? Well, I think the bread and butter here, um, for anybody in federal practice, typically is employment discrimination because there are so many cases of that kind in this district. And as I said, I did a, I probably did more defense side work for several different clients, um, some of them in South Alabama, than I did plaintiff side. But again, did a, a fair amount of plaintiff side work as well. I think, again, perhaps naively not understanding that you had to do one or the other, um, I just did both. and. Um, it probably was, was better that way. I probably learned more about how to handle, handle that sort of litigation. Um, I, can't, I can't think of many more specifics um, just because the, the cases are, are leaving my mind at the moment. Um, I did do some corporate law, um, some business representation um, I think I even helped Mike a bit with some securities matters, although certainly not in any great depth. My firm did a fair amount of banking work. 
and I was involved with that. Um, really, it was a practice that ranged over almost everything. I even went to bankruptcy court a few times to help people in Mobile who needed somebody to go. Um, so I, I, I had a, a, a lot of experience with a lot of different kinds of cases. And because I was pretty much by myself, I think there was a point at which we hired an associate, but um, most of the time I was sort of on my own. I just learned how to practice law by getting my feet wet and doing it. And I, I might have benefited from a little more mentoring or something of that kind, but it, it wasn't available in that remote an office, so I just went ahead and, and, and did the best I could. And your secretary then was? Sandy Edwards, yeah. still my secretary or now judicial assistant. And she went to work for you early on? That she did, you know, not, so. not just as I got there, but um, sometime after that. So she's been with me a long time. You were at Miller Snyder for about seven years, I think? I think that's right, Miller Hamilton. I'm sorry, Mir Mil Miller Hamilton. Tell us about why you decided to become a magistrate judge. Maybe it was that early girl state experience. Um, <clears throat> I think I always thought being a judge was would be very interesting, and maybe that is some um, some sort of desire to be to be involved with <clears throat> the problem solving side of things. I don't know that we always solve problems. Um, law is. Is, is a bit of a blunt instrument and it can accomplish some things but um, sometimes something like mediation can can get a dispute resolved even better but I I was interested in that sort of adjudicative function in um, trying to make decisions trying to exercise judgment as as well as as good as possible. I'm not sure that's grammatical, but to, to do that as well as one could. And I think um, some of the other parts of judging that attracted me relate to my um, old interest and maybe abiding interest in um, in literature as well, because I like the storytelling. I like how lawyers to hear how lawyers shape their cases, and I like to hear how litigants talk about themselves and what what has happened to them and how they frame um, what has occurred and how they want to relate that experience. So there are a lot of elements to it. And obviously it, it still used the, the skills that that I thought I had been given more of, like being able to perhaps read and write and uh, and speak some. I would have been perfectly happy to, to, to be a, a singer, but I couldn't sing and and uh, or a dancer, but I couldn't dance. So I mean, I, you sort of take what you what you can do, and um, and it it was a way to, to use what I thought I was better at. Well, tell me about the process. How did you become a magistrate judge? I applied, um, as you know, in this district, uh, the uh, and everywhere I guess the district judges appoint the magistrate judges, and um, they do that after a citizens committee or a committee of uh, both private citizens and other lawyers and, and others meet and talk about the applications and pass on names to the district judges. Um, so I, I applied, um, and uh, my recollection is it was a pretty lengthy application, and uh, ultimately was interviewed here and, and chosen uh, for the job some years ago, uh, going on close to 10 years now I've, I've been in this job. I think 1996 That's was right. when you took the bench. Um, tell me a, a something about your experience as a magistrate judge, and what do you like about it, and what do you not like about it? Well, I guess the things not to like are the the fact the primary fact would be that it's very difficult. Um, people's lives are involved. I don't want to to overstate. Um, the importance of what I do. I'm not suggesting that this is um, the most important, that I do the most important job in the world or anything of that kind. But on the other hand, the litigants involved and the lawyers involved and the other people in the courthouse even, uh, all are 
um, I think, care a great deal about what happens. And they, they, the litigants come to us in times of really great difficulty for them, or at least great conflict. Um, and decision making is always difficult. It ought to be difficult. Um, it should not be routine, and it should not be easy to affect somebody's life in as substantial a way as we can, to the point of imprisoning people. Um, so I, that's both maybe the hard part and the, uh, I wouldn't say I don't like it as much as that it is just difficult and, it's, and one ought to be mindful that it's hard, but it's also the challenge of the job, or at least a part of it. And what are your favorite parts about being a judge? Um, it's, I do, I do enjoy the stories. I do love to hear people on the witness stand. Um, I'm delighted to be in a profession where I don't just interact with my, quote, peers, uh, but where I see regular people and they see me, and I'm not suggesting I'm not a regular person, too, because I guess that's the point. I see the kinship there. And I enjoy hearing what they have to say. Um, I think, I mean, it is a challenging job, and, and you, you ought to, you ought to want a challenging job. This, this is one of those. Um, to me, some of the biggest challenges are not even so much in trying to, to make the right decision, although that's a huge challenge and a big part of it, but in also trying to. Um, approach the job with some some kind of, of humility about one's own ability to be wrong um, and and about the fact that it's I'm not saying it's it's random that I'm a judge I understand that there were certain things that I did that that ended up permitting me to do this but there are still um, I still have much more in common with the people who come before me than I than I have different from them, if that makes sense. And um, I think it's it's important to remember that. And it, I think something else I enjoy um, and take as a as a challenge is um, trying to to treat people with a certain amount of respect, trying not to uh, to fuss needlessly. This is. Again, I don't want to suggest that it's more powerful a job than it really is, but to the extent that there is some power involved, it ought to be wielded with care, and it ought not be used to make people miserable, whether those are the litigants or the, the lawyers or the people that, that we work with every day. Well, you have a, an excellent reputation in this district as a mediator and as a magistrate judge generally. You had to say that because you're sitting right there in front of you me. Know, as a mediator as well. Uh, tell me what you like about mediation. Well, I like, first of all, that I'm not confined to legal remedies. Uh, so, as you know, in, a, in any given case, the, the, let's say the plaintiff, if he or she wins in a civil case, can only get certain things from the defendant if, if that individual or, or company or whomever prevails. But in a mediation, we can trade for anything. Um, I have had mediations in which golf clubs exchanged hands, and I'm willing to be creative about that and try to figure out some way to, to come to a resolution. I remember another one in which um, uh, it was important to the particular a litigant that a videotape be made and be and be sent out to certain people. I mean, it, it's a it's a opportunity for some creativity. Um, it's an opportunity to come to resolutions that maybe are more satisfying than what you can get in court sometimes, and to do it without exposing everybody to the uh, uh, often very painful process of going through litigation. Not to mention the expense of litigation and the time involved. Here, unlike many <clears throat> judicial districts, the magistrate judges actually conduct civil jury trials. Do you handle many of those, and what types do you handle? You know, th there's some years when I have lots, and some years when nothing seems to go to trial. So 
I'm not sure quite how to respond to the question, do I handle many of them, because it, sometimes it depends on the time period. I, am, I always have a lot of cases set for trial. Um, I will have a, a civil consent docket that um, can... I guess that would be more specific. Do you have a large civil yes, consent Yes, I mean, docket? I guess that could, that could be, you know, 80 or 90 cases at a time. Uh, it could be as few as 30 or 40. Um, just depends. But, uh, but it can be quite a large number. And it, as you know, they may or may not go, go to trial. And remind me the rest of your question because I lost it there. What types of cases types. do you see most frequently? Um, I think employment discrimination really does dominate the docket here. But once you pass that point, it could be anything. It could be uh, diversity cases that involve uh, car wreck or truck accident, um, slip and fall, um, all kinds of tort cases uh, of that sort. Uh, there could be very large business disputes. Um, it really, really runs the gamut of almost anything you can imagine in, in civil practice. Because we're here in, in Montgomery, and this district does include the capital, there are many that involve government in some way. Um, yeah, I can remember when I first came trying a case uh, relating to a boy who was bitten by a tiger. So. I mean, you just sort of never know what's going to come up. But the magistrate judges here do uh, are on the same rotation as the district judges. So whatever comes in the door is something that we may end up with. Explain that to a little greater extent. I, I know that because it's different from most districts. Uh, someone watching this may not have an understanding of how that works here. So if you would just briefly explain. Uh, cases here are assigned, both civil cases are assigned both to magistrate judges and district judges. And then the parties, and, and we have a certain percentage that are divided among the magistrate judges, a uh, fairly substantial percentage. And then the parties either decide to consent to our jurisdiction or don't. And if they do, then we handle those civil cases just as a district judge would handle the civil case. And we're the equivalent in terms of what our authority is to the district judge for that for purposes of that case. And that's been very successful here. We have, um, again, a, a large civil docket among the magistrate judges here. Other districts, as you point out, may not do that, but we do. You also play a sub very substantial role in the criminal docket of this court. Can you describe that, please? Sure. We do the initial proceedings just as magistrate judges do in other districts. Um, that's, I think, almost always the magistrate judge's responsibility. So that will be everything from initial appearance to arraignment to uh, detention hearings, um, preliminary examinations, those kinds of things. We also handle warrants and writs and various other uh, proceedings that we do in chambers. Um, that's dominated, I guess, by complaints and arrest warrants and search warrants and, and a few other things. But past that point, uh, in this district, the magistrate judges are also assigned to cases uh, just as the district judges are. That is, on every file there would be a district judge and a magistrate judge's name. And the magistrate judges would uh, have the preliminary hearings on matters like motions to suppress sometimes on motions to dismiss or motions to sever. It, not as frequent that we would hear those, but in all of the cases, uh, all of those cases uh, involving almost any kind of preliminary motion, we would enter a recommendation for the district judge after having heard um, anything that was necessary to hear, and then we also take the pleas by consent um, if, if the uh, defendant's consent to having us take the pleas. Um, and that, that's most of our work in criminal cases. But because so many of them are resolved on pleas, we end up having a, a substantial amount of interaction with the criminal bar and with the parties in and, those cases. And that, too, I understand is unusual for this district as opposed to other districts. I, I again, don't know quite how many do it that way now. Um, it's, it's a continuum. Some do nothing but the preliminary matters, and others do as much as we do. 
certainly in our district, we have always thought of ourselves as a, I think the term is a, a full utilization district. So the utilizees are the, are the magistrate judges and, and uh, we do participate very fully here. If you can think of any memorable cases or incidents that have occurred to you on the bench, I wish I, were, those. I wish I were that kind of storyteller. I've I have had um, things happen in the courtroom that um, I would not want to put names to. They I, and I couldn't at this stage. I don't recall uh, in great specificity. But as I said, pe when people come into the courtroom, frequently they are um, in some of the most difficult times of their lives, which I think it's it's really important for us to be sensitive to. And, but one of the ways you know that is the number of incidents involving people having, for example, seizures. I've had somebody have a heart attack on the witness stand, uh, and thank goodness. Someone this, had to use the defibrillator. That's right, and I was not the hero um, who administered that. Uh, bless their hearts, our uh, marshals service, um, our, our deputies are well trained, and in that instance, um, I think I, I hit the panic button, but the court security officer was right there with his, um, I'm sure the technical term is not walkie-talkie, but his radio or whatever he had, uh, both of us trying to get some assistance. And uh, the marshals were there in a heartbeat uh, using defibrillators that we had purchased not that long before. And actually they were able to, to revive this man who I'm told um, very likely would have died uh, if they had not been there with that machine and had not acted so quickly. We actually had a probation officer already administering um, CPR before the defibrillator got there. So they acted um, just as you would hope and, and did a great job. But there, there are lots of, of incidents of people crying or shouting out or even, as I said, having seizures or other things that, that that sort of emphasized the, the difficulty of what they're going through. And so I remember those things. Um, I remember a few incidents in which the marshals have had to, to restrain or, or subdue somebody, which is, again, from behind the bench, a, a bit of a shock to witness. Um, and there have certainly been amusing moments all along. Um, sometimes witnesses say things that are, are are frankly really funny and it is terribly difficult to sit and keep a straight face um, sometimes and sometimes um, we say things that are incredibly stupid judges do and it's hard for everybody sitting out there to keep a straight face so those those moments occur and uh, sort of um, are, are, are in, in my view except for the for the parts in which people are in some kind of distress or, or pain uh, the, the funny parts, at least, are, are very pleasant, and they're nice, um, nice again, to, to recall that, that we're all just there doing our best in uh, sometimes very difficult circumstances. What's the most rewarding part of being a magistrate judge? Well, it may be some of what I've, I've told you to this point. In, in some respects, I feel best when I've um, done something that I think is very basic and very fundamental and can't be forgotten, which is I have given somebody an opportunity to be heard, and I hope to be heard fairly. And I know that they may not like what the decision is, as everybody always says, but it's true. Half the people don't like what you do because you rule really against about half of them. But um, the you know, behind all of this edifice that we're in and, and the mechanics and machinery of justice is a, a very simple concept. And, uh, and it's one that I may relate to best coming from being an English major, which is if you appreciate freedom, and, and I do, and I'm, I'm not trying to, to, to fly the flag here, I just mean freedom. I mean freedom as an individual, freedom to, to, uh, to learn and to do and to uh, to, to be whomever you, you wish to be, um, then you appreciate law. And 
when I say I approach that as an English major, might it's, it reminds me of things like sonnets, uh, which Shakespeare and Petrarch and many others wrote, which had very strict rules, very strict form, but it was the form that allowed the freedom somehow to, to create something really, in that case, uh, aesthetically uh, beautiful. And here, the, um, you know, the laws are what give us an order, ordered society, and it's hard to appreciate every day um, just how, how precious that actually is. So it's, I think, a very good thing to be able to, to be a part of that and to try to, to behave in a way that is responsible and that is civilized and that is rational, even though those things are, uh, and I should add, and that is civil too, but those are things that maybe are not, that we take for granted or are not as dramatic um, as being uh, a great um, music star or a, a great athlete or whatever, but they're, they're terribly important and it's, and it's a, um, a privilege, I'm, I'm trying not to speak entirely in platitudes, but it is a privilege to, to participate in that and I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. So I feel good when that works. And I also feel good when I think um, I've had an opportunity, may, maybe even just a, a situation where I could have been, um, when I could have added to the misery of somebody's life and I didn't do that. And I found some way not to do that and yet I hope to, to, um, to do my job at the same time. So I think it's as, as simple as that. Judge, I'd like you to tell us some about the workings of your chamber and how you operate on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, I think the most important thing to say is that I am, am grateful uh, to have two colleagues within cha chambers and then uh, uh, my deputy clerk as well who are just absolutely wonderful at what they do. Um, my clerk is Joyce Taylor and We've mentioned my judicial assistant, who is um, Sandy Edwards, and Sandra Marsh is uh, a career law clerk. Um, and it, it does not exaggerate to say, uh, even though I, I know that it's maybe too common to say this, but um, it does not exaggerate to say that this none of none of what is done here could be done without them. And many times. Um, to be candid, they are the people taking the lead on, on certain things, and I'm a, a resource that gets deployed, if that makes sense. Um, they are, each of them, very, very capable. Um, I trust their judgment. They are um, on top of everything else besides being skilled at what they do. They are good people, which is the kind of folks you want to have around you. And um, my chambers may be unique in this sense. Um, among us, we have quite a few children. Sandy has two boys, um, and Greg and Matthew, and uh, Sandra has three children. Um, there's uh, Sean and Lauren and Allison, and of course I have Lanier. And among us, at, particularly when I started, we had quite a few younger children, all of us women, all of us sort of juggling career and family. And uh, one of the nicest things about this chambers is that we help each other out. We get our work done, we work very hard, um, we make sure that we don't sacrifice um, what we need to do to do our jobs here. But we are flexible and I suppose you would say child friendly um, in the sense that all of us will help each other when, uh, when we need to. A few minutes ago when we were doing this videotaping, uh, you will recall, although it didn't appear on the tape, that my uh, assistant stuck her head in and said um, she'd just had a call from someone who was supposed to be picking up my daughter at school who hadn't been able to find her. And, uh, of course, she was found. That was just a, uh, one of those mix-ups that happens sometimes. But the point is that we all help each other out in, in situations like that and get them handled. And that's a, a real pleasure to work with other people who have that sort of spirit and are willing to, uh, to help each other. And uh, Joyce, of course, is an important part of that, although she doesn't have the younger children. She, uh, she just does a tremendous job of keeping me organized and, and uh, ready and 
and on the spot. Um, my colleagues here at court, um, apart from what happens in my chambers, are also a, a great pleasure to work with. We have a very collegial court and uh, the magistrate judges get along well. We get along well with the district judges, the circuit judges, the bankruptcy judges, and, uh, and it should be added. We have an, an extremely fine staff, uh, including the clerk's office the court reporters, and I don't want to leave somebody out, so I'm not going to mention more names, but we have a, a terrific group of people who work very, very hard here, and I'm, I'm delighted to be part of it. Moving on to some other of your interests, I know you mentioned earlier that you have taught at Eckerd, and I know you've taught to other judges a course in law and literature. Tell me about how that came about, and tell me about that course. I know it's very popular with your fellow judges. Well, it's it's just so much fun. It would hard it would be hard. Let me put it another way. It's kind of like falling off a log to to get people to enjoy that because basically, especially when it involves judges, you get a bunch of judges together who who don't get much chance to talk to each other, um, who who kind of live in their private little worlds and their in their chambers. You get them together and then you give them something very very good to read. That they don't have time to read normally, and then get them talking. And uh, it may have been your observation that judges don't like to talk, but it is not mine. And they, uh, and I, I'm sure you know what I mean. I mean, it's hard to stop everybody. So um, it's a it's an easy class to do, and it's it's a, a whole lot of fun. And the way I got started was. Let me see if I can remember. I think that John Carroll, who was one of our magistrate judges here, who's now, as, as you know, the, the uh, dean of the law school at Samford in Birmingham, was on the education committee for magistrate judges. And at some point, he and I talked about the, uh, the, the fact that all over the country people were starting to do classes that sort of combined uh, discussion about law and literature both. and and. Either I suggested we do one or he asked that we do one, and I'm not sure how that came about. But I called a professor of mine that I'd kept in touch with from Eckerd. Uh, his name is uh, Dr. Emperick, Julie Emperick, um, who is a, just a terrific teacher, and asked if she would be involved in teaching magistrate judges law and literature. And, um, and she was eager to do it. She um, said she would be delighted to come. She does all the heavy lifting. And I just sort of sit there and, and, um, and participate. But we have done a program, I think, at every magistrate judge's conference now for several years. And we'll do it again this year. And the, uh, the selections are things like um, The Death of Ivan Ilyich by Tolstoy or um, um, Antigone. Uh, we've done some Shakespeare. We've done... Uh, really quite a, a range of people, uh, quite a range of literature, and uh, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. And then Julie asked me to come down and teach undergraduates with her, and this is just for uh, winter term, which is about a month, and I, obviously I can't take off a month, but um, I, I would go down a, a couple times during that month, mostly on weekends and uh, maybe the early part of the week, and talk to students, look at papers. Um, it's interesting to teach undergraduates and teach judges because it's a very different sort of enterprise and uh, both enterprises sort of help help each other. We learn from both in, in ways that help us I think do better with either audience. So that's that's the, the answer to that question. It's just been a, a, a good experience and a lot of fun actually to get to do some teaching. Well and I can't believe we've gotten this far along in the interview with only now mentioning Shakespeare. You were a Shakespeare expert in oh heavens no, <laughs> in uh, at Oxford, and you I know that you can quote or you can actually speak the lines along with all of Shakespeare's plays. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I had memorized all thirty six or thirty seven, uh, I would be doing some other job because that would really be remarkable. But no, I I haven't done that there. There's some lines that I remember from many of the plays, and I don't remember trying to learn them. They just are kind of in my head, so I can I can say them, and I take special pride in misquoting from time to time. Um, 
but I, I love Shakespeare, and I, it's sort of hard not to, I think. Um, and I studied a lot of it as an undergraduate and really got going uh, in, in that regard um, because or by going to lots of, of plays in England, in London. I had never seen theater like what they could do before. So um, I guess I've read, I think I've read all the plays. Um, but I can't remember a good many of them. Do you use, ever use the Shakespeare lines in your opinions? Well, I would love to if I had the opportunity. <laughs> but uh, I have not been called on to do that or to uh, translate any Middle English for an opinion yet. Uh, you also uh, mentioned something earlier about this edifice, and, and as I'm sure has been probably discussed on some of the other oral histories that have been taken. Uh, this beautiful courthouse has been built during your tenure as a magistrate judge. What role did you have in, in that project? I, I really wish I had had more of a role, um, but we had some very able district judges involved from the beginning working on this project. Um, all of them inv were involved, and in, in particular I think Judge Thompson and then Judge Albritton were the chief judges who participated. and. Uh, much as I love architecture, I can't say that I had a real hand in developing these plans. Uh, much of that was done before I came and was carried on after I came, I think, without me. But uh, really the only role I've played is the, uh, we do have an, an, an art committee for this building, and you know from furnishing your own office and for the tape I need to say you're the, uh, uh, the U.S. Attorney for this district and have been for some time that there are very rigid constraints on how much money can be spent for art per piece uh, in a uh, federal facility. My recollection is I think we had $200 for each piece of art, and that was all, and that included the frame. And frames, as you know, will take up half of that or, or more sometimes. Um, so I was involved in trying to find inexpensive but good art for the courthouse, and that's actually the, the uh, funding uh, restrictions are why you see a lot of photographs if you come back to the uh, portions of the courthouse that are the, the secure corridors, because we found that the Library of Congress had lots of, of prints, many of them uh, of Alabama, many of them taken by people like uh, uh, Walker Evans back in the days of uh, the Depression and that those could be had for small sums. And uh, we've also been able to get loans of, of beautiful art from other people in Alabama who've been kind enough to put their, um, their art here. Some of the art's a little controversial, but that's okay. Um, gives you something to talk about. And has, was your area of responsibility the art inside the building? Yes. Or? And I know some of the photographs, or many of the photographs, are from Depression-era Alabama, is That's that right. correct? And I should add that, that I'm not the only one who worked on the art. There were others uh, on the committee and plenty of people who've spent a good bit of time on this, including our clerk, Debbie Hackett, um, and, and others. And uh, one of the best projects here is children's art. And lots of us had, having young children, um, ask ask our kids to come in and uh, B. Lee Tullis, who is an art teacher at Montgomery Academy and has worked with young children in producing art, uh, got together with a lot of the uh, sons and daughters and ne nieces and nephews and grandchildren of court employees. And I think your son may have been involved, my if I'm not mistaken. Involved. So uh, Will Canary participated and so did my daughter. Um, and they all got together and did pastel drawings of Alabama wildflowers, which are beautiful, and they're in our snack bar, and uh, we've talked about doing more Alabama wildlife, for example, or fish or other things, and bringing in more children as time passes. And uh, that fell within our spending limits as well. I know you have a deep interest in Alabama history and Alabama countryside, especially in is it Elmore or Chilton County? Elmore. <laughs> Elmore County. Tell us about that. Well, I, I have always, and you can hear from my talking about growing up, um, had 
a, a yen for the outdoors, I guess would be fair to, to say. And uh, since I grew up, it seemed to me a lot of the time uh, spending summers and falls and so forth outside, and I think typically barefoot and probably um, getting pretty dirty. And after being here in Montgomery for a while, and of course Montgomery's not a, a, a huge bustling metropolis, but I still found that I was indoors all the time, and sitting behind a desk and looking at a computer, and that I, that I wanted to do something different. And my husband and I both um, thought that we would look for some land in the country, which lots of people do. Um, so we fell in step in that tradition and looked around. I'm looking at a picture above your head. In fact, I've got a picture on the wall of, of the place that we bought. We went to Elmore County, and uh, there were there's a landscape there at the fall line, um, really the end of the Piedmont, which is much like where I grew up in, in Tennessee, much more hilly and uh, sort of a mixed oak uh, beach hickory forest uh, with mountain laurel and wild azalea and um, jack in the pulpit and lots and lots of beautiful wildflowers. And we um, read about this particular property, went to see it uh, with a realtor. And uh, my recollection is that my husband took one look at the creek, which is a, a, a wide granite bottom creek with some waterfalls that flows right through the, the heart of the property, and leaned over and whispered to me, uh, I don't care what you have to do, but get it. And then took off and went walking down the creek. And uh, so I did the negotiating, um, which is, is, is my, one of my roles in the family. Um, and it took us a long time to purchase the property, but we did. And it's, a, it's about 75 acres, mostly woods, and there's a cabin, uh, which we redid. There was a 1950s cinder block cabin. And we spend uh, a lot of our time on the weekends there. And uh, my husband and I love it. His family, I think, loves to come there. Our friends, I hope, like to come there. Um, I think my daughter, Lanier, who is 13 and, and pretty much a teenager, might prefer to be in New York City. I'm not sure. But uh, she's a very good sport about going as well. And um, we spend a lot of time with family. The lake is very close by Lake Jordan. So we also uh, spend some time, uh, the kids water ski, and uh, we have a canoe, and we kind of do the things you do out in the country. And a firing range. And a fire, we do have a place to shoot. And a pizza oven. We have a pizza oven, um, which is the marvel of all, and uh, envied far and wide. I'm not sure about that, but we, we do have a wood-fired pizza oven, which turned up after we made several trips to Italy and we're in search of the, the world's best pizza and trying to figure out how to make that. And uh, somehow I talked my family into thinking we might need one of those. So uh, my husband got it for Christmas for me, it sort of imported much of the apparatus from Italy. And uh, our contractor, uh, who we think the world of, whose name is Pete Powers, um, did the stonework and there it sits and uh, we use it nearly every weekend and um, it does a pretty fine job on pizza and also lots of other food and I don't have to add this because you know this but uh, my husband is an extremely good cook yes, I do so it that. never hurts to give him another opportunity. Um, I know that you spend a lot of time reading at the creek. Tell us some of the things that you have read or are reading now. I don't know that I could give you a title now. Um, you have you have successfully figured out that the that the main position at the creek is is horizontal. <laughs> it's a it's a place um, with a big fireplace and a and a lot of comfortable sofas and window seats. So it is true that that all of us read um, a good bit there. I I don't know how to say what I'm reading now. I used to read novels most of the time, and I have had, I think when I met you, I was reading, rereading classics, so I, um, at least in law school, had read um, some of the big thick books that I'd been a, a avoiding, like um, Anna Karenina and The Magic Mountain and um, The Brothers Karamazov, some of those books that everybody else had already read, I was finally getting around to. And 
So for a long, long period, I would read fiction. Now I read more nonfiction, probably. And, you know, it depends on what the interest de jour is. You know, right now, or in recent times, it has been some Alabama history, a lot of natural history. Um, you might even call it, if, you, if we were in England, it would be referred to as landscape history, I think. Um, my daughter laughs at me because I will read a book with the title Dirt. You know, I'll read a, that to me is good natural history, something about the dirt. Or um, material history interests me. Um, yeah, so she, she also laughs that I've read a book on, I think, the, I think it was the history of the screw. Um, or the screwdriver, or so. Anyway, I, those kinds of things interest me. But, but um, that would not be the only category. I'd probably, at any given time, reading a bunch of different things. I know that you've read a lot about uh, the history of Native Americans in Alabama, particularly here in Central Alabama. Yes, and I don't think I would have come to that independently. That was a function of that property that we bought and wanting to know something about, as really was some of the natural history reading, but wanting to know something about what used to be on that property, who used to live there, what their lives were like. So yeah, probably in the last 10 years I've done, I've read what I could find at least of, and, and I, the, the things that I, have, that interest me the most are the primary source materials, but there are also are very good um, books written by for example, professors at Auburn um, about about that sort of history that are that are very good that I've enjoyed as well. You also uh, participated in the building of your house there at the creek, and and I think um, I'm not sure you're supposed to ask questions you about this kind of your thing. art talents. Well, I just want to get everyone to have a full sense of who you are. Well, uh, I think my art talents, as you kindly put, it might be a little overstated. And the fact that in this interview I've referred to doing art doesn't mean that I'm really that good at it. But tell, tell us about the tiles that you and your family made for your kitchen and bathrooms there. We just wanted to participate a little bit in, in the, what was being built. And again, we had this uh, great contractor who was open to our doing that. And and I've got, I had at that time, a, let's see, I guess she was maybe eight or nine years old when we began and then a little bit older when all of this happened. But I had a, a, a young child, younger child, uh, who I thought uh, might enjoy the opportunity to, to again, participate in, in what was going on. So anyway, we decided to make some tile um, for a backsplash in the, in the kitchen and thought we'd do it right and, and called a professor at AUM who does ceramics and said, could you help us? And she was... Uh, very kind, and she agreed to do that. And uh, the whole family pretty much went to her studio, and she had a press that could roll out these sheets of clay. And then we all sat around, and and I guess you'd say we carved them. I mean, it's sort of like relief carving on clay with these little tools. You remove bits of clay, and the images that we created were, were in my view, rather pedestrian images of, of the wildlife at the creek. So there's a raccoon and there's a fish and a snake and I think there's a snake and a, a luna moth, all kinds of, of things of that sort. And and really what we learned was um, how incredibly hard it is to do a, a good job at that and particularly to glaze things like that. Um, so all of our efforts turned out a little differently from what I think we expected. But um, it happens that if you take a whole lot of tile, even if it's not really good, and you put it together on a wall, it actually looks okay. So that's what we did. Um, my husband's very proud of doing the plain tiles, which meant that he didn't have to get involved in, in the rest, although I think he actually did do some uh, for one of, the, one of the bathrooms that he, he did some Indian patterns in or something. But anyway, we had a, a good time. Um, we, we might have said some some bad words in the process, but um, uh, we learned a lot about our limitations, but we had, we had some fun. And in fact, later, my daughter and I, Lanier and I both worked on tile, or doing the, putting mosaic tile on a backsplash in her bathroom. And then later than that, we did the floor of an outdoor shower with a bunch of broken ceramics. And, uh, and again, we had, a, we had a good time. 
Judge Walker, can you tell us what legacy you expect to leave? That's the sort of question that you really hope you won't get in one of these kinds of interviews because it's the frightening kind. I, I, don't, I, I don't really think I think that way. Um, so I, I'm not sure I can, can answer that question in terms of the, of the job um, here that I do. I, I would say probably like any parent um, that, that more than anything I hope I'm a good parent, and that, that may not relate directly to what I do in court. But if, if I had to choose um, the one thing that mattered the most to me, it would be being a good parent and, uh, I guess, in general, wife and, and mother. And that's, uh, that's not a, a political orientation or a political statement that I'm making there. It's simply a fact of, of, of my life. I have... Um, the most wonderful child in the world. Rainier is, is uh, just a terrific kid. And um, yeah, I'm, again, grateful to have that opportunity as well of, of, of being her parent. And I, I should add, just so that I properly embarrass her, because this wouldn't be a useful uh, videotape if it didn't have something embarrassing in it, that uh, not only is she smart, um, not only is she talented and creative, but she's actually a genuinely wonderful person. She is the nicest person I think I know. Well, in closing, Judge Walker, what do you see as the future of this court? That's one of those big questions that, um, I, you know, I'm not sure I've given it the thought that it, that it really deserves. Um, the sort of future that you want for a court is not necessarily a, a spectacular one. Um, the court ought to run well. It ought to arrive at decisions that are as nearly right in a legal sense, uh, and one hopes in a, in a broader sense as, as they possibly can be. And um, we want to improve in doing that. Um, and I, and I think we will. I think it's a group of people who are dedicated to, to doing their jobs as thoughtfully um, as, they, as they possibly can. So I hope for more of that, and I hope we, we do it better and better. And I think that's all I can tell you, except that I appreciate your being here and you're asking these questions. You and I have known each other for a long time since the Attorney General's office, and uh, not only did it take some time out of my day to do this, but it took a lot of preparation on your part, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate the help of our, our uh, videographer as well. So, thank you. But thank you, Judge Walker, for taking the time to participate today. My pleasure.